Of all the radio stations in Hull, we're one of them. Hull Kingston Radio. It's one Oliver station. At the time, I'd been thinking about writing a story about my grandfather, who, um, during the war, he was in the Merchant Navy and his um, his, his ship sank. Mm-hmm. And 14 of the men managed to get onto a lifeboat and they were on the lifeboat for 50 days. But at the end of the 50 days, there were only two men who were still alive. And they got picked up by the Royal Navy, yeah. and he was one of the survivors. So it's, it's an a amazing harrowing, story. harrowing story. Because I mean, you know, when you when you find, I mean, what is it like to actually find out that your relations when that your, one of your relatives went through that? Because it's it's a life changer, surely. Yeah, it is. It's it. What what was weird about it is when I was telling it to Katie, she um she actually. Although she knew what the end of the story was, yeah. she kept saying to me because she was only ten and she was she's ever there ever so canny at that age. She's not now. No, she is. Um, <laughs> um, she'd say to me, "Gosh, she's got to survive, or we won't exist." As if she believed the story so much that when I was telling her that it was happening, that she's willing him to live, so that obviously he he has my father who has me and I have Katie. Yeah. So and she that's knew. how magical it was to her that that she's kind of rooting for him, even though the story's already happened and it's in the past. And it, it got her through having the injections. And that was, that's me telling her that story inspired a short story that became the novel. So the, the short story that, she, that became the novel, what was it that made you actually want to write it down? Was it because, I mean, obviously it is an amazing reality. It's not even, a, you know, it's a story in itself, but it's a reality because it actually happened. What made you actually want to record this? Um, well, as a writer, I do write most things down. Hmm. Um, the, just the poetry in it, the fact of um, it was kind of a story within a story, which can be a good way to tell a story. Yeah. Um, because it, it to show how powerful stories are, that they can get people through things, and for me that's what stories are. And um, Sorry, ask me the question again. I've gone completely <laughs> she has another over tea. there. Yes, just what made a, you want to write the story down? And a, another thing is um, the diabetes. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, you've got children with special needs. Mm-hmm. There's always, when you've got a child who has something to struggle with, there's always a, a need and a want to put it out there yeah. and let people know what it's like because obviously there are, well, tens of hundreds of thousands of other children mm-hmm. going through that. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know. so it's a, an experience of, of sharing so that people aren't alone. It, it is opening up that part of your life, which is, it, it is, it, you know, very distressing, but it's also private. Yeah. But it, there's something almost cathartic, I suppose, about opening it. Um, you know, and, and writing it down yep. for you as a mother of this child, you know, who has diabetes, that must have been quite a healing process for you because you obviously were just getting your head around this as well, mm. this diagnosis, mm. because obviously children, they're so resilient. Um, a diagnosis to her probably didn't mean that much at that stage. But to you, you knew what mm. it meant. Mm. And that would have been very difficult, I suppose, for you as a mum, because mum has to get it first, doesn't she? She has to know what's involved in this. And this, and you go on the Internet don't you, and there's awful horror stories and you and, and it, it's it's just awful. Um, you know, and you fill yourself with dread and and then somewhere along the line, you see somebody's written something positive about it and you, you latch on to that. And that's what keeps you going. So almost, I suppose, writing this helped you co- go through a healing process. Absolutely. Because there's not much literature out there. There's factual literature. Yeah. Perhaps, I'm, I'm not sure if you've ever looked into it with autism either, but there's plenty of factual literature about yeah. um, type 1 diabetes. But with regards to fiction... In, in any novels, I researched it afterwards, there's very little there that cover the topic. Yeah, there is, there is very detail. little, yeah. Um, I'm not sure with autism, although to be fair, um, is it Jodie Picoult? She, she wrote a book where she um, wrote first person story as if she had autism. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you've read that one. I haven't actually I read, haven't that, one. read I that one. I might look that one up. Yeah, and um, that would be interesting. And she apparently did a lot of research. She herself had no experience, but she did the research. But another thing I often think is when you have got the experience like we have, mm-hmm. it's almost it feels like a duty maybe that I've got the ability to write, so I need to use that gift. I mean, there must be a reason for that, and therefore use that gift. And if you know you can spread the word that you know you will get through this. This is what happens. This is scary. This mm. is how it goes. But look you get through it in the end talking to louise beach the renowned hull author um <laughs> and she's talking about her novel how to be brave now tell us this it started because obviously you were telling stories to your daughter who had had a, a diagnosis of um type one diabetes 
Uh, and this is why you told her the story to try and make it easier for her for the injections, take her mind off it. And um, and through writing this, I think you've often said you found out more and more things about your relative, but also more about yourself as well, I suppose, yeah. when writing about this, the experience. Um, I know definitely when your child does have a diagnosis or something, it is a very lonely time and it's scary. Mm-hmm. And you, you almost feel like a child yourself sometimes because you have all this responsibility on top of you. And you need an outlet of some kind. Not that writing is an outlet, but for you, you were born to write. They say if you wake up in the morning, all you want to do is sing, then you're a singer. Mm. But when you wake up in the morning, you want to write. And that makes you a writer. Mm. So you've obviously been one of these people who has always written down your emotions, has always found that as as a way to express yourself. That's how you do it. Mm. Um, Now, other people have seen the... I mean, I've read your work. It's fantastic. Everyone who's read your work thinks it's amazing. Um... And it, and and in a day and an age, it, it it is very difficult, I think, for authors these days because there seems to be a, a kind of a theme every couple of years. A couple of years ago, it was filth, fifty shades or forty shades of grey and whatever. <laughs> not that we've read them, but not that I've read cover them. to cover. I know. <laughs> I don't have a well thumbed book of that. Um, there were three of them actually. Um, but <laughs> the thing is, is, is that it, it runs on a theme. And once a filthy book came out, loads of other filthy books came out. A couple of years before that, it was all about um, it was all about children, child abuse. Mm. That came out. It was all about these children telling harrowing stories you know, of what happened to them as children. So it kind of runs on a theme, doesn't it? Yeah. And some fantastic authors kind of can get lost amongst all those themes because it's not in at the moment. It's not perceived popular. Yeah. Um, a good book will always be a good book. Um, which is why we pick up novels from written hundreds of years ago. It's why mm. we're still picking up Shakespeare. It's why we're still studying, you know, Jane Austen. It, it, a good book will always be a good book. Mm. Um, I think at the moment, reading has almost gone out of fashion, I think, uh, with a lot of people. And I mean, do you find do you find that, you know, that a theme runs and that you, you get kind of get lost amongst that? What I found, which really ties in perfectly with that, is that I did have an agent for my other books that I'd written before these. Mm -hmm. And when she sent it out to publishers, literally unanimously, they had praise for the books I've written, Mm -hmm. but no one would take it on because they weren't sure where they could um, pigeonhole me because they weren't sure what genre I was. They weren't sure how they could market me because it kind of maybe defied sort of a description or a type but to me, that's the biggest compliment in the world. Absolutely. Because who who wants to be, oh, you're that and you're that and you're that. How wonderful to maybe be something that, well, I can't quite explain what it is. Mm. It's just great. But sadly, the publishing industry, they're frightened at the minute because obviously we're going into people reading on Kindles. Amazon's huge. There's a lot of other people, you know, competing. So they're frightened to take on a book that's not guaranteed a success. So they're tending to go for things that do fit like you say like they were going for the 50 shades they'll go for say that's a thriller so we're safe because it's a thriller Mm. that's a horror that's a romance but something that's not quite fits anywhere they're a bit nervous you know on taking and i don't understand because it is it's a business after all but if i had a company i'd take so many on that fit the genres and then i'd think we're taking a few on that that don't give a chance but that's I mean obviously that's if if you were in in, in charge unfortunately <laughs> you're not it'd be cakes <laughs> and gin if I was in charge oh hell I'd be writing books <laughs> um so tell us because you have had success with this novel this is why you're here today to talk about this amongst amongst other things which I'm, I'll be keeping you for the entire show um tell us what uh, what success you've achieved recently with the novel uh, what is wonderful about this award it's called the loop bit med bursary award mm-hmm. and legend um books are the the publishers who run this award what happened was um one of the first books that um legend press sorry they're called legend press not legend books legend press yeah. um are an independent company okay. and one of the first books they published was by luke bitmed and very sadly he had mental health issues and very sadly he committed suicide before he mm. could enjoy the success of his his first book and so his family raised the money every year and have an award in his name and the winner is published by legend press and wins 2500 and it's i think this is the seventh year of the award and it's to recognize writers who struggle with issues and kind of 
keep nearly getting there and not making it, nearly getting there and not making it, and it just it recognises them. And so I've sh- I've shortlisted for that this year. I'm one of ten who have shortlisted for the award. That's fantastic. How does yeah. that feel? I can't even describe it. It was last Tuesday, I think, when I found out, and I kind of just got up and walked around the room and then went back and looked and thought, is that really my name on there? Walked around the room. I admit I cried a bit. I was emotional. When I rang Grace to tell her, I got so emotional. Grace I was is like, your sister, yeah. Yes, my sister Grace. Um, I did get emotional. And then I was just clapping my hands like a five-year-old. But it's, like, it, it <laughs> is marvellous because it is somebody telling you your work is worthy, yeah. you know, and that oh, must be, yeah. Yeah. you know, you write obviously for your own pleasure, but you yeah. also write to be published for other do. people's pleasure. Everybody wants, that's the aim. I mean, we'd be lying if we said that I write only because I love it. I do write because I love it, but gosh, I want people to read it as well. Because it absolutely spread the joy, but it yeah. is that person telling you your, your writing is oh, good. it's wow. From a professional point yes. of view, you yes. know, and that, that must mean everything. I mean, it's great it friends and family saying your work is fantastic, but to have it from a professional That's who it. reads thousands and thousands from to actually for your your writer to be pinpointed saying this is worthy of this prize yeah. is fantastic yeah. well, who's been telling us all about her um, story how to be brave and it's been uh, shortlisted for a major award an international award <laughs> uh, remind me of the name of the award again Louise the Luke Bitmed bursary and it's by uh, Legend Press the the the, the publishers right. who will publish the book if it wins. And when will you find out? On the 28th of November. Not that it's circled in blood red on the calendar with stars around it and hearts around it. Yes, no, it is. not at all. <laughs> in London. I have to go to London. Oh, how exciting. No, just doing that alone, going to London to go to an awards ceremony. Now, obviously, the connection with your grandfather now, you're going to... Are you going down to the Cenotaph in London? Yes. For a trip, and you're going yeah. to go to... Is it to represent your grandfather? Yeah, that's only two weeks away. I've just realised that's two weeks away. I'm going with my sister, Grace... Um, because he was in the Merchant Navy and my uh, my aunt's cousin, she is the head of the Merchant Navy Association, she's mm-hmm. the president, and every year she marches um, at the Cenotaph with all the Merchant Navy veterans. Mm-hmm. And we've been invited, me and my sister, to go and kind it's of actually, represent Colin Armitage. So you're going to take part in the in the march? Yeah, we'll be oh. in the march. We'll be, see, we'll be seeing the royalty and, I mean, David Cameron, whoopie do. Sorry. Give great, him a kick David in the shin Ca- yeah, if he passed. exactly. <laughs> Um, taking part in the march and whatever afterwards I think there's a lunch at the British Legion afterwards I just be, I just can't believe it to be honest that that's amazing know, isn't it isn't I wonder it? what he would have thought of all of this oh, I know I know because he was only young when he did die because he survived all of that on the lifeboat and he got home he survived enough to have his three children but he still he died when he was 27 gosh really yeah so I think the amount of life lived in that 27 yeah. years, the, all the experiences, yeah. and then 27, it's yeah. just like a, a young man. A child in 27. Yeah, it is. You look back, it's his child. Oh. Um, sadly, I think probably being on the lifeboat contributed to that. It was, I think officially, I think was um, heart failure and asthma contributed. But I do think those things maybe would not have been you know, at the age of 27, had he not gone through that experience. Yeah, I think a, a huge experiences like that, yeah. you can't come out of them unscathed. It's either physical no. or emotional. God, you you know, something like that happens. Yeah. Um, but the positiveness to come out of it yes, absolutely. is you, his granddaughter, and, and his great-granddaughter, yeah, of course. Uh, and the fact that you've done this and that it's going to be recognised. And yeah. I think it's going to win. <laughs> I think it ought to win. Um, oh, but I'm not a you. judge, unfortunately. Uh, how I wish I was. <laughs> <laughs> I would be open to all sorts of bribes, Louise. <laughs> and mostly involving... Child. Of all the radio stations in Hull, we're one of them. Hull Kingston Radio. It's one Oliver Station.